Part 5, Section 2, Chapter 7 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 The Congregational Church. Before the opening of the 19th century, Congregationalism was hardly known outside of New England, but its influence on the nation was by no means commensurate with its geographical position. New England was the backbone of the revolutionary struggle, and her democratic church polity had not a little to do in training the nation for freedom. It was Thomas Hooker who unconsciously prophesied the Constitution of the United States when he said, quote, a general council, chosen by all, to transact business which concerns all, I conceive most suitable to rule, and most safe for relief of the whole. End quote. It was Samuel Adams, that bright flower of the sturdy Puritan line, who drew up the first protest against taxing the colonies, and whose genius lay back of the great declaration. In 1801, a plan of union was entered into with the Presbyterians, which swept the whole Puritan immigration outside of New England into the Presbyterian Church. This wholesale sacrifice was at length brought to an end in 1852, and since that time Congregationalism has made a splendid record in religious evangelization and educational work in the West. Some of the best schools in the West have been founded by her sons, and the Puritan influence on Western civilization is one of the most remarkable phenomena in history. In 1852, the Congregationalists of the East and West came together in Albany, and since then the National Councils have tended to cement the denomination and unify its work. The intellectual earnestness of the Congregational clergy has given rise to various theological controversies. Jonathan Edwards himself gave a peculiar turn to the Calvinism of New England, and this individualizing of the general thought was carried on by his son. Further discussion was caused by the position of Samuel Hopkins, the holy and devout minister of Newport, Rhode Island, 1770 to 1803. The influence of this great thinker has been felt in all the later history of New England theology. His friend, Nathaniel Emmons, pastor at Franklin, Massachusetts, 1773 to 1827, and who died in 1840, in the 96th year of his age, pushed this rationalizing of Calvinism still further. In 1807, the two schools of thought united in the founding of the first theological seminary in the country, that at Andover, Massachusetts, where the first foreign missionaries were trained, and where the great institutions, the American Education Society, the American Tract Society, and the American Temperance Society, had their origin, and where the oldest religious newspaper in America was planned. Perhaps the most exciting stir in New England, on matters of religious controversy within orthodox lines, was caused by the opinions of Nathaniel W. Taylor, professor of theology at Yale College, 1822-58. The stricter Calvinists, led by Bennett Taylor, waged a relentless warfare against Taylor and the theological school he represented, and so deep was the animosity of that time that many of the Connecticut Congregationalists withdrew their support from the Yale Divinity School, and founded a new theological seminary at East Windsor, 1834, which was moved to Hartford in 1865. The most recent controversy is that caused by the alleged departure of Andover Theological Seminary from the Puritan landmarks, but to this reference will be made later. The Congregationalists have had an honorable preeminence in all fields of Christian activity, they were the first to enter the foreign missionary work, 1810, and their American Home Missionary Society, founded in 1826, their American Missionary Association for Work Among the Colored People, founded in 1846, their Education Society, founded in 1816, and their other benevolent societies, 
have been among the most influential agencies for the extension of christianity in all its varied aspects End of chapter seven